All right. <clears throat> so this evening we begin a brand new study of the book of Philippians. Uh, I want to share with you for the next few weeks about joy in all seasons. And, you know, we live in a world where everyone is searching for happiness. Everybody. <laughs> But the problem is that happiness is a hard thing to find. And it's an even harder thing to hold on to, right? Uh, true happiness is, is fleeting. It doesn't last. But genuine joy <clears throat> is an altogether different matter. Uh, joy can be found by everybody. There's, a, there's no one that cannot find joy. Like a stream of living water, it abundantly flows out of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is boundless and it is unstoppable. And, and so as we begin this book, four, four chapters uh, that Paul wrote, a letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi, Paul wrote this letter while he was in jail. And so tonight I want to talk to you about jailhouse joy that even though Paul was in jail in Rome, and he was in jail for doing right, he was in jail for preaching the gospel, he was a political prisoner. He was arrested not because he was a criminal or had hurt anybody, but he was arrested because uh, the Jewish people didn't like his message about Christ, and the Romans would work with the Jews to arrest Christians and persecute Christians. And so Paul was in jail in Rome, and it was a miserable place to be. It was more like a dungeon than, you know, a comfortable jail cell. And he didn't know, you know, what his future would hold. But yet, <clears throat> instead of being down and depressed, he was full of joy. <clears throat> and he writes a letter from jail about joy, the joy that he had in the Lord. And so if Paul could find joy in Jesus, even in the dire circumstances that he was in, uh, we can find joy in Jesus too. In our text, Paul wrote a letter of great joy to believers in the church at Philippi while he was being persecuted as a political prisoner in Rome. And so as we, as we go through the letter, we're going to read the word joy or rejoicing over and over again. I mean, it's a constant theme that reoccurs. And remember that as he wrote this, remember where he is. He, he's, he's not in a, in a good place. And so sometimes when I'm in, trying to encourage somebody who is being mistreated or literally in jail, or literally in some kind of uh, terrible situation, I encourage them to go read the book of Philippians. I'll say, hey, it's four chapters. You know, go read this book and realize that the guy that wrote it was in a situation like you're in, in a very dire and dark situation. And yet, that situation could not rob him of his joy. And so the main thought I want to share with you this evening is that joy can be found in Jesus through all seasons of life. And so we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight. Then we're going to slow down. Next week we're going to see the Easter story according to Paul. That's going to be interesting. We're going to kind of look at Paul's uh, version of the Easter story. But we're going to try to cover this chapter uh, tonight. So I'm just going to read the... I'm going to read the first part of it, and then we'll read the rest of it as, as we go through. But the theme tonight, as we think about jailhouse joy, is that joy can be found in Jesus through all seasons of life. So let's, let's read the first 11 uh, verses, and then we'll, we'll cover the rest of it as we go. So the letter begins, Paul and Timothy, servants, and that, that word there is the Greek word doulos, which literally meant a bond servant, which a bond servant was a slave. It was the lowest status of society. And so Paul is referring to himself and his young disciple Timothy as bond servants of Jesus Christ. 
to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. So the church at Philippi, Philippi was a leading city. It was a city that sat on a very important road. And, you know, it was a, a, a city that had lots of metropolitan things. And it was a city that <clears throat> having a church in that city was very important. A church that could reach a lot of people. We'll come back and deal with that a little bit more in a minute. <clears throat> the overseers are the pastors, that was the New Testament word for the pastor. That, that's the word that's used the most in the Bible for the office of pastor, the word overseer. Uh, the word pastor is not used very much. It's only in First Peter. We, we use the word pastor often today because of what it means, shepherd. We, we, it's, a, it's a tender word. But when you see the word overseer, uh, that was the word that most of the churches used in the day of the Bible to refer to the office of the pastor. And then there's the deacon. And so those are the two offices of the New Testament church. There's the overseer or what we call pastor, and there's the deacon. And so he's writing to the church at Philippi, and <clears throat> now... When we think of the church at Philippi, or even all these cities, understand, and, and you got to realize, they didn't have a big structure where all the Christians met. They, they didn't have church buildings. Most of the churches met in homes. And you'll read a lot about the churches in, you know, Priscilla and Aquila had a church that met in their house, and... Mary, the mother of John Mark, had a church that met in her house. So, so the, when, when he's writing to the church at Philippi, it's not like one big church. It's mul many churches that met in houses. And they all had overseers, pastors. So when, when you see the plural there, it's because you had all these houses. And they all had a, a pastor and deacons. And they, they knew each other, they loved each other, but they would often meet in houses and they would outgrow one house and have to multiply to another. And so sometimes it's hard for us to understand church like it is in the Bible versus kind of the way we do church today. So he's writing to the church, to the overseers, the deacons. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he says, verse 3, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. There it is. I mean, right out of the gate, there, there's the word joy. I, I remember you making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I'm sure of this, that he who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus, of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the days of Christ, uh, uh, blameless for the day of Christ, fulfilled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God." All right, so let's, let's stop right there and then we'll, we'll read the rest of the book as we go. Father, thank you for joy, the joy that we have in Jesus. Teach us about that this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so there are three things that I, wanna, I want you to see with me in our text tonight about joy. Jailhouse joy. Jailhouse joy means joy even when you're in a bad spot. Number one is this, joy comes 
from investing in others. It is isn't amazing that Paul is in jail and Paul is facing persecution and potentially even execution and he's not at all talking about himself. I mean, he, in that first part that we read, he's, he's praying for them. He's not asking them to pray for him to get out of jail. He's not saying, hey, pray, pray that I would get out of here. Pray that, that uh, I would not get executed. I mean, he, he's, he's concerned about them. He is praying for them. And, and one of the greatest joys that we have as believers is the joy of investing in other people. There's, there's incredible joy in that. And so we look at his words and he says that, uh, I remember you always in every prayer of mine with joy. So he's praying for them with joy. He, he thinks of their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And so when he first came on, on, his, first, on, on his second missionary journey, <clears throat> he came to Philippi, and we're going we're to kind of dive into that in a moment. And, and those people became partners with him in the gospel. So the first day until now means the first day that he came to them. And he said, I'm sure of this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Philippians 1.6. I'm sure that he who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. That is a great verse. When you hear me talk about the eternal security of the believer, that I believe that once you are truly saved, that you cannot lose your salvation, there's many verses in the Bible why I believe that. But this is one of them. Paul said, He who begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so when I lead somebody to Christ and I believe that they're truly saved, I'm confident that he who begun that good work, he's going to finish it. <laughs> I mean, he is, yeah, you, even you. Uh, he, he is more, listen, he is more committed to us than we will ever be committed to Him. I will never be as committed to God as God is committed to me. I feel good. And I never can be. I feel as good. And that gives you joy. And so, He who begun a good work in you, and I can tell people that. I can tell people that He who begun that good work in you is going to be faithful completed. So here's Paul in jail encouraging them. He's encouraging them. He's still investing in them. And he says, it's right for me to feel this way about you because uh, you are partakers with me of God's grace. And uh, in my imprisonment and my defense and confirmation of the gospel, it, God is my witness that I, I yearn for you with affection. And my prayer is that your love will abound more and more. So he's praying for them that you may approve what is excellent and so he's, he's constantly, even in jail, investing in them. Now I want to go back and, and just review the people that he's talking about. Alright, so when he's in jail thinking about these people, let me kind of share with you who some of these people are. Okay? Paul went to Philippi when he was on a missionary journey, and in, in Acts 16 verse 9, as he's on this journey, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over here to Macedonia and help us. Now we call that the Macedonian call. You may have heard people talk about Paul's Macedonian call. So when he's out there on the mission field, this is a vision. So he's having a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over here, we need your help. So they got in a boat, they sailed over the sea, they came to Macedonia, and when they got to Macedonia, the very first city that they went to in their missionary work was the city of Philippi. That was the first city 
that Paul evangelized on his Macedonian call. Now, when he got there, how do you... If there's no church in a city, if there's no believers in a city, where do you begin? Well, you begin by building relationships, right? So, so there was a group of people that would gather at the river and they would pray. Now, they were God-fearing people, but they did not know about Jesus. And so, in, in Acts 16, verse 11 and 12, it says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, so when they got the Macedonian call, they sailed from Troas. We, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for a few days. Now verse 14 says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the thing spoken by Paul, and afterwards she was baptized and her household as well. So the very first convert in the city of Philippi was a businesswoman, which was rare <laughs> in those days, a woman. Her name was Lydia. She was a seller of purple. And she knew about God, but she didn't know about Jesus. And God opened her heart to believe the message that Paul shared with her, and she and her entire household was saved. Now, she went on to have a house in her church. It says that, that she, when Paul later went out of jail, we're going to talk about that in a minute, that he went to the, the church that was at her house. So the first church in Philippi started with a lady named Lydia, who was a businesswoman in, uh, in Philippi. So when he's writing from jail and saying, I, re I have joy in my heart because I remember you and your partnership in the gospel, he's talking about Lydia. He, he remembers Lydia. Now, after he led Lydia to Christ in Acts 16, verse 16, it says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a demonic spirit of uh, divination met us who, who, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. And Paul, being greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and he came out of her that very hour. So here is a young girl who is demon-possessed, and she's almost like a slave because her masters are, are using her ability to tell fortunes almost like a McBray kind of way to get money, and they're making money on this demon-possessed girl. And Paul because she kept following him around everywhere he went, she kept yelling and saying, these are servants of the Most High God. He cast the demon out of her, and this girl was set free from those demons. So when Paul is writing from jail many years later, he's thinking about those that bring him joy who are partners with him in the gospel. He's not only thinking of a businesswoman named Lydia, but he's thinking about a demon-possessed servant girl who was saved uh, in Philippi as well. Now, when he cast the demon out of that girl, the guys that lost their income because she was making them money got angry. They didn't like that they lost money. They didn't care the girl had been saved. All they cared about was they lost money. So they began to complain, saying that these guys have come here to stir up trouble, and so Paul and his partner, Silas, got arrested. This is before that he's in Rome. This is when he got put in jail in Philippi. 
So Paul got put in jail quite often. All right. So he was in jail in Philippi, and not only did they put him in jail, but they beat him with rods. They beat him and Silas with rods. I can't imagine what that would be like, but it would uh, it'd be incre- excruciatingly painful. It was, it, it, today we call it caning. It only happens in third world countries. It's so brutal. And it, it can kill you. I mean, they take, can't tie you up, take cane poles, and beat you to a pulp, and leave your back bloody and, and bruised, and, you know, and, and it's, it's horrible. That's what happened to Paul and Silas. They were publicly humiliated, they were beaten with rods, and they were put in a Philippian jail, which was like a dungeon. And when they got put in that Philippian jail, you remember the story? That at, at midnight, what happened? Yeah, they started singing. They started singing hymns, and then an angel came, and there was an earthquake that shook the jail. The, the chains came off, the doors came open, and a lot of the prisoners fled, but when the prisoners fled, the Philippian jailer was going to commit suicide because in those days, if you were a Roman jailer and your prisoners escaped, they were going to execute you. <laughs> so he decided, I'll just go ahead and take care of that myself. So he was going to commit suicide. And Paul said, don't do it, we're still here. Okay, so uh, in Acts 16, verse 29 through 23, the Bible says he called for a light. He ran in, the Philippian jailer, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In other words, saying, I don't know what you guys got, but whatever it is, I want some of that, right? I don't know what kind of joy you're on, but boy, I, I need some of that joy. If you're down here singing after you've been beaten with rods and you're in jail, and, uh, and they said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. And, and, and yeah. I got a question. Yes. Said that he was saved in his household. Yes. So when he was saved, then automatically his household was saved. Not uh, not from the standpoint of saving grace, but in those days, men were such strong leaders in the family that usually, if the man was saved, the family would follow, and and that's somewhat true today. A lot of times. If a man is saved in a household, many times the wife, the children will, will follow suit. But so, so Paul, it says after that, Paul spoke the gospel to the whole family. And then they were baptized. So they all had to individually put their faith in Christ. But, you know, he was the spiritual leader of his home, as he should have been. So in, in other words, when Paul is now years later... He's in jail in another place. He's in Rome now. And he's, he's writing this letter to the Philippians and he says, I remember you with joy and he who begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Now we know who he's talking about. He's talking about a businesswoman named Lydia. He's talking about a slave girl with, that was demon-possessed who, who, who was set free. He's talking about a jailer who was about to commit suicide and, and Paul led him and his family to Christ. And they became, as Paul said, partners with me in the gospel. They began to spread the gospel throughout the city of Philippi. And, and the gospel began to spread and the gospel began to grow. And house churches were being set up. <clears throat> and they, they experienced the grace of God. And so Paul in jail was more concerned about them than he was himself. And that's where his joy came from. The joy of investing in others. You see, when you're in a when you're in a bad place, in a tough spot in your life, 
You can get inwardly focused and start saying, poor me, and have a pity party, and you'll lose your joy. Or you can say, you know what, I'm in a bad place, but I can still minister to others. I can still invest my life in others. And that's where joy comes from. Many times I have visited somebody in the hospital or somebody going through a bad time, and I go there to try to be an encouragement to them, and I leave being the one that got encouraged. Because I'm going there because they're in a bad place, and, the, and the, all they want to talk about is me. They'll say, well, how are you doing? How are your kids doing? How are your grandkids doing? Oh, I just lay here in this hospital bed praying for you. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, and, and that's, the, that's joy. They're not sitting there saying, oh, poor pitiful me. They're, they're in that hospital bed thinking of everybody else. And so that's where joy comes from. Joy comes from investing in others. All right, secondly, joy comes from advancing the gospel. All right, look at verse 12. Now let's, let's continue to make our way through the book. He said in verse 12, <coughs> I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has already served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He said, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. For the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. There's the word joy again. I rejoice. And, and so Paul is saying that my imprisonment has brought about the advancement of the gospel. So here's what Paul did. When he was in jail, he was always guarded. There were always guards. And those prisoners, those, those jailers thought Paul was in jail. You know, really, they were the ones in jail. They were what you would call a captive audience, Right? Because they couldn't leave the prison cell. They had to guard Paul. And you know what Paul did? Paul said, hey, let me tell you about this man named Jesus Christ. And let me tell you my testimony about how I didn't believe in him. And I was, I was kind of like you. I persecuted the church. And then one day I was on this road going to persecute the church. And I met Jesus and he changed my life. And, you know, he's given me joy and he's given me forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And... He rose from the dead. And you know what? If you believe in Him, you can be saved too. And Paul was leading those prisoners, to, those uh, prison guards, to Christ. And, and he said there, he said, uh, he said, what happened to me is served to advance the gospel so that it has become known to the whole imperial guard. The entire guard, those that were on guard duty in Philippi, Every one of them knew about Jesus Christ. And, and many of them were being saved. And he said, not only that, but most of the brothers, and that means the other brothers, having become confident of the Lord in my imprisonment, are much more, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he's saying, they've seen my example, that I'm in here in jail and even in jail, I'm sharing the gospel, and they have, they've got, that's given them boldness. So now those that are out of jail are sharing the gospel more boldly throughout Rome, because he was in jail in Rome at this time when he wrote this letter. And so the, the, we're talking about Rome here. We're talking about the city of Rome, that in the city of Rome, these jailers were being saved. In the city of Rome, the people that were believers were having confidence to share the gospel. I remember my question. Yes. Do you, have you ever thought about this, how they changed names of 
people that are like like God changed. Okay, your name's going to was this, and now it's going to be this. Your name's this, now it's going to be this. Can you, can you, I, I just wanted your thoughts on that. Yeah, we talked about that last Sunday, as a matter of fact. Oh, wow. How Levi's name was changed to. Hey, y'all were listening. Matthew, yeah. So yeah, a, a new identity in Christ often. You're a new person, and often. I want to change my name to Gia. Okay, go ahead, go for it, go for it. You should change your name when you're a new person. She knew me before. She just said to me, and I didn't remember. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems like it should be something important. Well, Saul was Paul, right? Before. Oh, Paul was Paul. Now he's Paul. Yeah. So his name was changed. So, anyway. Uh, yeah, sometimes you could change your name to match your new identity in Christ if you desire to do that. Not everybody's name was changed. You know why though you did it, or what the reason was? Uh, because they had a new identity, you know. Uh, Levi was a tax collector. Paul was a persecutor. Somebody answered this question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Paul said some of those that are getting boldness are preaching Christ because they want to be known. They, they want to take my place. They, they want to be somebody. And he said, so they're preaching it out of pretense. He said, some of them are preaching it out of sincerity. They really want to, to preach Christ for the right reason. But what did Paul say? He said, I really don't care <laughs> if they're preaching Christ for the wrong reason or the right reason all that matters is the name of Christ is being preached. He said, it doesn't bother me. So, so you see, joy comes from advancing the gospel. Paul is not concerned about the fact that he's in jail. He's concerned about that, hey, I'm in jail, and because I'm in jail, more people are being saved, and that's all that matters to me. My adversity is resulting in the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've had people that have told, that have told me this. I, I was talking to a guy who had cancer and you know going through all the stuff that goes with that, chemo and sickness. And, and he told me, he says, you know, he said, Pastor, I've been able to witness to more people than I ever had in my life. He said, every, every doctor, every nurse, that, that comes, I share the gospel with him. And it was almost like you could see the joy, not that he had cancer, but the joy that he had in spite of the fact that he had cancer because of the opportunities that was presenting him to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So joy comes from investing others, and joy comes from advancing the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said in verse 16, If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. He said, woe is me. In other words, if I have the answer to the dilemma of sin and I don't share the gospel, woe is me. And then in verse 19 of that same chapter, through 23, he said, Though I am free from all men... I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under the law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. I mean, what he's saying there is, I tried to build relationships and find common bonds with all people so that I might share the gospel. So he said to a person that was weak, I tried to build a bridge to them and identify with their weakness. If it was a Jew... I tried to build a bridge to them and befriend them and share Christ with the Jew. If it was to a Gentile, I tried to build bridges to them. He, he would try to identify to the degree that he could with all people 
so that he might win them to Christ. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, Paul said to his young disciple Timothy, he said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, His prisoner, but share with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So it's all about the gospel. Joy comes from investing in others. Joy comes from advancing the gospel. And then the third thing I want to show you tonight is that joy comes from living for Christ. <clears throat> Look at verse 19. Joy comes from living for Christ. In verse 19, he says, Yes, I will rejoice, for I know... There's that word rejoice again. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ... That, I will, that it will turn out for my deliverance as it, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And then verse 21 is one of the most powerful statements in the entire Word of God. For to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruit from my labor. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to, part, to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ because of my coming to you again. So joy comes from living for Christ. Paul... <clears throat> He's in jail. So could he be executed while he's in jail? Certainly. He could be martyred. Later he was actually executed in Rome. Uh, but not this time. But he says this. He says, for me to live is Christ. If I live, it's all for the glory of Christ. And he said, if I die, it is gain. If I die, I'm better off. I mean, <clears throat> the worst thing that can happen to a believer is the best thing that will ever happen to us. And that's death. You know, the moment we die, we are better off than we've ever been before. We have no idea how incredible death will be for a believer when we get to be with God in heaven. So that verse, to live is Christ and to die is gain, in many ways I think that was Paul's motto in life. I mean, that was, that was the way he lived his life. If I live, it will be for the glory of Christ. If I die, it's going to be gain. So he wasn't worried, was he? he? He had joy because he was living for Christ. He said, I'm even hard-pressed between the decision of which one I want. But he said, if I stay, it's going to be more fruit for you. And so I choose to stay if that's God's will. Even though it'd be great to depart and be with Christ. And I love the word he used, depart. Death is not termination, it's just a departure. So when we die, we depart to be with Christ. The moment we die, we depart to be with Christ. And he said, you know, I'd like to choose that, but I'd rather stay so that I can bear more fruit among you. And so he said, whether I stay or whether I go, he said, I, I know that I'm going to be in, in joy. I have joy, but you know, I want to stay with you. And then he said this in verse 27. He said, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. He's, now, he's, now he's investing in them again. And he says, since I'm living for Christ... 
I encourage you to live for Christ. <clears throat> Let your manner of life be worthy of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. And that's what we need to do at the library Monday. We need to stand firm in one spirit. Stand firm in our faith. Stand firm in our belief. Stand in unity. But do it with grace, with humility, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so we see in verse 19 through 26 that there is, there is the joy of our salvation. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's true for every one of us. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So that's the joy of my salvation. I live every day knowing that if this is my last day, then I gain. I will be in heaven with God because I've been saved by grace. So we live with the joy of our salvation that Satan can never take away. I mean, you know, Satan can put bad things on me and... and, and cause bad things to happen. But bless God, I'm still saved, right? I mean, I'm still going to heaven and there's nothing He can ever do about that. And, and so that's where our joy comes from. And, uh, and so there is the joy of our salvation. I love Isaiah 12 verse 3. Isaiah said, Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Therefore, with joy, you draw water from the well of salvation. Where does our joy come from? The well of living water that comes from our salvation. You see, lost people don't have that. That's why lost people are always on this mad search for happiness. And usually they're searching in all the wrong places for it. Bars and clubs and, you know, you name it. And, and they might have a night of getting drunk and laughing and they say, well, I had a happy time. We call it what? Happy hour. <laughs> right? Happy hour. And that's about it. It's about an hour, right? And then you go home and have a hangover and you're miserable for the, for, for the rest of the week. And you ha but you had a happy hour, right? And, and that's the way happiness is. You might have happiness for a moment and then you, then you go home and throw up and have headaches and... You know, you got to search for the next moment. So happiness that the world is searching for is like counterfeit. It's not real and it doesn't last. And no believer will ever know the joy of salvation. They, they don't know if they were to die that they would be in heaven. To die for them is not gain. To die for them is horror. To die for them, when you think about it, the worst hell that we're ever going to experience is here on earth. This is the worst of hell we're ever going to have. Then we go to heaven. But for an unbeliever, the greatest heaven they're ever... The only piece of heaven they're ever going to know is, is here on earth. And then they experience an eternity of hell and separation from God. You have had your joy. Or, in the Bible, there's a scripture. I can't ever quote it. You've had your joy and now that's it. Or something. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You always <laughs> Let me think on that one, Cindy. You've had your uh, joy, you've, you've killed somebody, and so now yeah. your joy's over. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. I think you're th maybe you're thinking of the uh, story of the rich man Lazarus, maybe? Where, on this, where he said to the rich man, you had your things while on earth, and... Lazarus did, and now Lazarus is here and you're down there. So maybe, yeah, yeah, so good. Yeah, good analogy. So, so we live with the joy of our salvation. Now, there is also the joy of other salvation. 
So, so not only do I have the joy of my salvation, but I have the joy of, of your salvation. When, when we lead others to Christ, and you see somebody that was lost saved, and you see the difference in their life, that gives you joy. I've said before that probably the greatest joy you'll ever know is the day you're saved. And the second greatest joy you'll ever know is when you lead somebody else to Christ. When you lead somebody else to put their faith in Christ, that is joy. So Paul, in the first part of that, 19 to 26, he's talking about there is joy in his salvation. And then in verse 27 through 30, he's talking about the joy that he has in their salvation, those Philippians that he's writing the letter to. In 3 John 1, 4, or really 3 John verse 4, because there's only one chapter, 3 John 4, John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now John's talking about his spiritual children because he's about 90 when he wrote this. He had a lot of spiritual children. And that's the way it is. You have no greater joy than to hear of your children walking in truth. And, and so can you have joy in your life even when things are, when you're in jail, when things are bad? Yeah. Yeah. Not like Christ. That's right. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So are you searching for happiness in all the wrong places? Was. Was. There you go. Was. Well, you're never going to find it. But would you have, would you like to have the joy that only Jesus can provide? Now let me tell you, as we wrap this up, as a believer, can you lose the joy of your salvation? You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose the joy. Remember David, <clears throat> when David gave in to the sin of adultery and he turned away from God and tried to cover it up and lived in rebellion to God and and for a while, we don't know how long, you know, he was living a secret life. And then one day, a, a prophet named Nathan confronted him and basically said, you're the man, you know, you've sinned against God. And David finally was broken and contrite. And he wrote a beautiful psalm, Psalm 51. You might want to go home and read it. It's, it's the psalm that David wrote after... Nathan confronted him and he repented and turned back to God. And do you remember in that psalm, in his prayer in that psalm, do you remember what he prayed? One, you know, after he said, against you and you only have I sinned, God, blot out my transgression. And he said, restore to me, what? The joy of my salvation. And he said, then I will teach sinners about your ways. <clears throat> so, we can never lose our salvation, <clears throat> but we can lose the joy of our salvation when we, when we turn away from God and we rebel against God and we let sin come back into our life. Yeah, you can be a Christian and, and not have joy, but you can get it back when you confess and repent and turn back to God. Then God will restore to you the joy of your salvation. So, don't ever lose it. But if you do lose it, turn back to God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this great letter. We just got started, but what an incredible, what incredible man Paul was, Father. He, he had joy even in jail. He had joy even in a dire place and uncertainty and fears around him. He had joy because... His life was all about investing in others. It was all about advancing the gospel. It was all about living for Christ. For Him to live was for Jesus and to die was gain. And Heavenly Father, I pray that we would follow His example. I pray, God, that we would live to invest in others. I pray that we would live to advance the gospel. I pray that we would live for Christ. And that no matter what Satan might throw our way, no matter what ditch He might try to get us to fall into or, Lord, what 
darkness He may try to bring into our life, that no matter what He does, that nothing that He does can rob us of the joy of our salvation. Father, we thank You that we can draw from the well of the joy of salvation every day of our life. Help us to remember that, God, and experience Your joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.